Um, so, my name is John, as some of you know, and uh, I want to apologize in advance that I'm not going to be able to make it a, a stick around afterwards. I would love to chat with people. There's a lot of old friends here I haven't seen since the before times. Um, unfortunately, I forgot that today is a public holiday in Spain where I live, and if I don't make it on the 12.30 flight uh, back from Zurich, my wife will murder me in very creative and messy ways and hide the body never to be seen again. So I, I beg your indulgence. Uh, it's nothing personal. Uh, those of you who have my email address, feel free to share it with anybody who wants to yell at me afterwards. I'm, I'm used to it, so um, so, um, this is, I work in the financial sector, this is uh, uniform these days. Um, I am here to uh, bore you a little bit with the single most important thing that you're going to hear all month. I'm a little provocative. So, because I'm going to bore you, I encourage those of you who have a short attention span to um, consider clicking on or opening random QR codes that somebody at an information security conference is sharing with you. I, I like doing this when talking to an audience of mainly technologically very gifted people, because I know that when I myself was, at, is, in, was in that situation a few years ago, many years ago, Jesus Christ, I'm old, um, I probably wouldn't want to listen to what I'm about to say right now, but it is, it is for me, very interesting, and I think I'll explain in a second why, and, and hopefully get people thinking a little bit. If you don't like uh, games, please consider visiting one of the many sites donating to uh, refugee charities or even the Ukrainian Armed Forces. It's a kind of a pet thing of mine. I didn't put it on there because my organization is quite sensitive about anything political, but uh, I do encourage you to consider helping out if you can. Um, leave that up for a second. So, who am I? Um, I've been doing this in various forms for a very, very long time. Uh, started out doing network security with uh, uh, UBS. I think about half the room in here is part of the UBS mafia. Uh, welcome to Switzerland. And um, I kind of joined the dark side. I went into things like risk management, architecture, strategy. Um, I speak a little fast. Um, sorry, I'm wired on a lot of coffee and very little sleep. That three, two, one thing that uh, Condit said kind of hit home before. Um, I currently work as a regional gango for a fairly large industry organization uh, serving the financial sector in terms of collective defense, information sharing, uh, resilience building, exercising, um, intel analysis, etc. around the world, and I'm located in Spain, as I mentioned. So I will tie this in uh, afterwards. I don't want to talk about what we do. Some of you who are in financial services firms may know us, may even be members, uh, but you will see why in my current situation this is quite important for me as well. So how many people in here are focused primarily on technological areas in their daily business? Quite a few. I assume a lot of people don't raise their hands because the geeks tend to not. So um, I'm going to assume about 90% of this room in some form or another. And it's not about technology. It is about technology, but it's not. Um, by the way, I have no idea if I can even get at speaker notes here. Do I have speaker notes? I guess I do. Cool. Okay, I remembered. I don't have any for this slide. What I'm about to tell you today is important for one reason, and I, this, is, this is why I, I like to justify the statement that this is about the most important thing about information security that you're going to hear in a while. It is the reason why we get paid. Quite simple. I don't know about you guys, I, this field is kind of interesting, although nowadays I prefer hanging out with my cats and drinking gin and tonic to doing techie stuff outside of work, but I do like getting paid. Pay, being paid is nice. You know, I can buy food. I like being able to buy food. Um, it's about why we are being given the tools to do what we all know we need to do. Um, one of the most frustrating aspects of our, I think, or at least of my role, and I've seen this with many of my colleagues as well over the years, is a lack of understanding why what we do is important. This has gone over several iterations in the past, I'd say, 25 years. You know, I, I got into this field originally because I read a book at a university called The Cuckoo's Egg. Or Cuckoo's Nest? Cuckoo's Egg? Cliff Stoll? Anybody read that? You're chasing East German hackers around, right? Teletype machines and stuff like that. Really old school. And this is kind of interesting. And this is in the days of, you know, movies like Hackers, right? Sneakers. Hack the planet. And it was cool and it was sexy and it was kind of tied into the, you know, disco rave scene and stuff like that. And it all turned out to be a lot more prosaic and mundane, but getting into the technological aspects of securing systems, securing networks, dealing with bad guys, malware, whatever. It was cool. It still is, you know? And I think back, maybe I'm romanticizing things. They say um, nostalgia is not what it used to be. Uh, but I remember distinctly an era, I think in the late 90s, when, when you know, 
there was a tendency, especially in large companies, to hire a lot of very, very smart people, pay them well, trust them, let them do what they felt was best. And that's where we started. Uh, the managers got a hold of this, and they realized that all the other big companies or even mid-sized companies were doing this. It's probably a good idea. Maybe we should start doing something. And we kind of evolved to the point where this became I, what we like to refer to as good practice or industry practice. I, I, our, our communications person who makes me make these slides really boring, I like to have like, you know, under construction gifts and, you know, all the stuff that one does these days, I guess, on here. I'm not allowed to, so forgive the dull, soporific effect. But, um, our friends from business school are doing this, so we should be doing it as well. And I think we're at a point nowadays where at some point the regulators realize that, well, the individual organizations that are critical to our society. You know, my, my wife is CEO of a fashion company. If, if, if she has a destructive malware attack, I mean, it's not good for them. She has 350 employees. Um, their customers are screwed. Their shareholders are screwed. Their employees are screwed. All their stakeholders are screwed. But on the societal level, pfft, nothing happens. She understands that, you know. Um, but if you're a large, you know, a medical firm, an airline, right? If you're, if you're a, an oil pipeline operator, a, I don't know, a hypothetically a um, national uh, air traffic control organization, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, if something bad happens, that obviously has impact that goes far above and beyond your own organization and its daily activities. And, and so this kind of gave rise to this concept of critical national infrastructure, where it became understood that a single organization and its leadership no longer have the, the competence, the authority, the right to determine what they invest in in terms of their security capabilities. You have to do certain things because you have a duty not only to your shareholders and your customers and your employees, even though some of my, my, you know, fellow business school alumni tend to forget that we also have employees and they matter. Uh, but you have a duty to society. You, there are rules that govern how you as a systemically important bank, hospital, Italian rail network, <laughs> again, purely hypothetically, um, affect your society and you have to basically do a bare minimum to secure yourself to make sure that shit doesn't go pear-shaped. That society doesn't suffer from your negligence, your lack of investment. Thus, we get regulation. We have to do certain things. So in my last, uh, my first and hopefully my last senior management role ever, um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore's uh, Technology Risk Management Bulletin, all right, anybody heard of this? probably for the best, was a really good tool. Because at the time, our budget started out at something like 85 million for the entire organization. It was cut to something like 55 million. It was cut down to like 40 million and 30 million and 25 million and 15 million. And finally, they wouldn't give us 4 million of that. And of that whole thing, uh, my, my own organization had about 7 million. And it was all the security testing and consulting and pen testing and, you know, software security stuff. And I told our management, well, it's sure, you can cut my budget, but... I just, you, you talk to the Singaporean regulator. I, you know, go talk amongst yourselves. And, and all of a sudden, my budget was intact. Um, but on top of this, we've seen a growth of a more, I think, systematic approach to why we do what we do, why we need to be doing what we're doing. And not just in the large, mature, systemically critical organizations like transportation networks, you know, water purification systems, power grids, et cetera, but really across the board. And this is risk management structures, risk quantification structures. And I realized that for somebody who is more interested in a technological aspect of their job, this is slightly less interesting than watching paint dry. I personally happen to find it kind of interesting because it's a whole area of basically connecting business to technology. Right? You're dealing with people. I, I, again, I went to business school. I had this joke. I told it yesterday. How can you tell somebody has an MBA? They tell you. Um, my colleagues are mainly from, from, from McKinsey, right? From PEs, from, 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 you know, business fields and business jobs. They have no clue, right? For them, this is not interesting. They don't care, right? So how do we connect what we do on a daily basis to what is important to them, which is essentially to help the business survive, to help the business grow, to, to, to ensure that we don't lose money and to ensure that we continue making money. We're not at the making money point yet. InfoSec costs money. It costs a lot of money. 
You know, my, my personal view is that a, a good quote unquote information security professional takes at least 10 years to develop, right? You can't educate somebody. You can't send them through a, a university education or an apprenticeship. You have to expose them to a multidisciplinary, multi-technology, blah, blah, blah. And are you talking about a, a code security person? Are you talking about an incident responder, an intel analyst, right? Database security guy, a uh, uh, crypto expert. There's a whole, there's a whole range of stuff that you can learn about that you can know about. And frankly, experience costs money. You want quality? You know, you're going to have to pay somebody for it. So you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Or in the, the words of, I, I swear to God, this is a quote, in the words of my former uh, finance guy at my last role, the thing you have to understand, John, is that things cost money. Well, that's a very wise assessment. <laughs> Thank you. Things do, in fact, cost money. And that is the thing with security. However, those of you who have ever been part of a budgeting process, well, those of you who have not, may you never. All right. I wish you good karma and happiness in life. Uh, but those of you who have had the misfortune of having to go through this, you will realize that you basically have to fight tooth and nail for every cent. It sucks. There are some notable exceptions, thankfully. And these, these leaders we have to respect because, you know, frankly, they're, they're not very common. But we are currently at this kind of crossroads between the regulators and the, the, the risk-driven approach where we've increasingly learned how to quantify um, what we need to do and what it's going to cost for us to help the business avoid damage and um, to even thrive in the future. So, who has encountered this? I know a lot of us have, right? Uh, my, my wife, she used to work for a big consulting company and, you know, this is and she gets it now, right? I've, I've, I've poisoned her mind with the, with the truth. But, uh, um, they used to not, um, put screen protectors on their laptops. And these are people doing multi-million mergers and acquisitions projects. I used to joke that the, uh, the most hilarious way to perform industrial espionage was to be in row two of a Lufthansa regional flight in Germany on a Thursday afternoon. Right? But you know why? Yeah? Because the, the McKinsey guys, the Bain guys, BCG, they're sitting in the front row. Uh, they have office day on Friday. And almost nobody in German strategy consulting, they work in their home, their, their home base city. They all go to projects. You know, they go from Munich to Hannover, from, you know, wherever. Um, and on Friday evening, they've all had a couple of beers. They're all stressed out. They haven't slept and they're pissed off and they talk a lot. Yeah. Or they're banging away on their laptops, putting together presentations to ruin all of our lives. So all you need to do is kind of look over. So she actually told me a few times that, you know, once she moved out of consulting into management, she um, called up a couple of their consulting providers um, and said, hey, you may want to have a word with your guys that were on flight so-and-so from so-and-so to so-and-so because um, they had very sensitive material about my company on there. And it would be kind of nice if they at least put a screen protector on it. Thank you very much. So I don't know what happened there. Um, but... Uh, you know this. And the hard truth is that the CISO is, in most cases, no longer a technology function. It's a business function. Because, again, this understanding has grown that, that security is there to serve a business need. The security is there not for its own sake, even though we know it's important, but there is a need to avoid damage to the business. Now, I want to take a step back and remind everybody, the reason I'm saying this is not to talk about how to build up a risk management structure to turn people into these, you know, business fanatics, whatever. It's to put in the back of your mind this, this kernel of context. Every time you talk to management, every time you do something, every time you, you, you engage in an activity that, that costs money, that requires budget, think about it in this term, right? Because it also may help you understand how to communicate better with the guys that are making your lives difficult who wear suits and ties. I stopped a long time ago. Not least because COVID made me fat. It's not my own fault. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you, there, it's a different language. Um, and the CISO, you know, frankly, or the CEO, is, et cetera, he, he doesn't care about the details, right? Uh, how, how many people in here have heard, um, don't, don't give me the details, just get it done? Yeah, really? Come on. Yeah, liars. Um, however, the CEO and the CFO and the CIO and the CTO and the board even, they have, in my view, an, a, a duty, a responsibility to understand what the check engine light on their car does. Right? You have a vehicle, you have to change the oil every few thousand kilometers. Right? Ideally, even you know how to, how to change a tire, but that may be asking a lot. The same way that they know information security is part of the critical functionality of their business, so they ought to at least have a general idea what happens when the alarm bells go off or when their experts 
tell them, hey, you should be doing something that's going to cost a certain amount of money. Uh, but it's up to us to meet them in the middle. We can't just assume that they're going to understand every little bit of detail about what we do. Um, so how do we do that? And this is what I want to talk about today. How do we meet them in the middle? How do we talk their language? How do we, how do we justify what we do so we can ultimately get paid? Even though, you know, doing malware disassembly is fun. Well, I used to, you know, I'm kind of bored of it. But, uh, um, you know, you, you want to, you want to get paid. You want to buy food. You know, you want your organization to thrive. Those of you who manage security organizations, you want to make sure that your people are taken care of, that they have the tools to do what they're doing. This is super important. Um, what is risk? This is my hyper simplistic explanation. It's pretty clear, right? We all know what risk is. It's, it's an instinctive thing. There's a whole science, if you want to call it that, black magic, whatever bullshit artistry, uh, that's grown up around risk and risk management, measuring risk and analyzing risk, doing something with what you've, 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 you've found out about your risk, risk appetite, risk exposure, risk metrics, yada, 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 right? But this is fundamentally the idea. Um, risk management gives us not only the tools to identify what it is that we should prioritize. This is better. The light's not shining in my face. Um, uh, nice and pale. And, but not only to understand um, what the main things are that we should be doing, but to talk to our management about why it's important, why we should prioritize it. And we manage the risk to our organization by attempting to quantify what is the impact of what we do and what does it avoid. That's basically it. We get budget, we get credibility, we get freedom to work because we are able to explain in numbers to the business management, especially the CFO and the CIO and the board. There's a number here, right? You may find it artificial. You may find it silly, but that's a question of the methodology used to get there, not the fact of the number itself. Because this is the language that they speak. The board wants to see a number. They want to see a dashboard. And you know the classic, the, the InfoSec dashboard trope. There is a red, orange, green. And if it's orange or red, I can click on it and it'll magically let me drill down to whatever level of interest I have. That is basically the way it works. Your board, your CEO, whatever, they don't care about technology. They care about the check engine light. And when the check engine light goes off, you take it to the garage, you take it to the subject matter experts, and you ask them what to do, ideally. Some CEOs don't. Those are bad CEOs. They should be shunned and shamed and named and whatnot, but they are a fact of life. Most CISOs, especially large organizations, in my experience, they may be impatient, they may be tyrants, they may be um, short-tempered, but they tend to understand if somebody comes to them with a clear so-what metric that shows them, hey, listen, I did my homework. Here's a model. Here's certain inputs, certain mechanics. Out comes this number. You said you wanted a number below X. The number is above Y, so what do we do? In order to get below X, my professional advice is that we need to do so-and-so. This is how you talk to them. This is how you get budget. This is how you make sure that you can go home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday because there's no trick bots or whatever, right? Um, um, and... I want to stress that risk management is not audits. If your organization has a risk management function, they're running around ticking boxes, they're auditors. They're bad risk managers and they should feel bad. The whole point of this is it's like practice tests versus the final exam. Sorry, I'm just checking my time here. Um, your risk manager is, an organ is a person, a function that needs to work with the technology guys. In, in the, the, the bank that I used to work in with the single best risk management team, we were consultants. We were experts in one area or another. There's one guy that was good on IAM, one guy that was good on crypto, one guy that was good on payments technologies. And we would work with the teams whenever we saw something they were doing that was stupid. You know, you're, you're a very smart guy with a visual basic for dummies coding book on the side saying, I'm going to build a core banking system. Yeah, well, maybe you should follow certain guidelines. Right? Um, so the question is, where do we get the guidance to do what we need to do? So where, what tells us how do we reduce the risk on an organizational level? Policies. I know. Sounds boring, right? Many organizations in here, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because this is the kind of stuff, again, that puts people to sleep. I did warn you. You did have a chance to escape except for the wristbands. Um, most organizations have some kind of a policy catalog. This could be really, really high level, super simple. 
And they're basically the things that say what you need to do, and they will then list a bunch of controls. You need to have at least, you know, 2048-bit or, you know, asymmetric crypto, whatever. You need to have a, a incident response progress a process. You need to have a so-and-so-and-so. -and -so -and -so. Um, you need to do pen testing regularly. Um, and they derive their authority essentially from three sources. So regulation, I mentioned earlier. Standards, do we want to be ISO certified or, you know, follow NIST or whatever? Um, and good practice. Hey, everybody else is doing it, so we might as well. But ultimately, your organization has chosen to codify these practices in a set of documents and rules that tell you, all right, this is what you need to be doing. Yeah. And then leave it up to you, the subject matter experts, to do it in the way that makes sense. So essentially, the, my father once taught me this, this military doctrine, which I think is nonsense, but whatever. Tell the man what to do, not how to do it. That's the ideal world. Um, and basically, these policies are the, 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 there's something that the CISO organization, the information security organization can advise on, right? But um, they are the organization's overall choice on what they want to focus on in terms of information security capabilities, technologies, etc. And so wrapping it all up, by the way, I hate slides. Slides make me stupid. I can't afford that. So I'm trying to keep these to a minimum. And like I said, I know these are boring. I'm so sorry. Um, and how do we fix this? Well, provocatively, we in this room can't. Most of us are not risk assessors, except we kind of are risk managers because everybody in a security function, whether technology, whether management, even budgeting is a risk manager in some way because we all have a contribution, and this is sounding kind of raw, raw cheerleader. I'm sorry, but it's true. Each of us contributes to managing our organization's risk. Some of us may not realize this. And what I'm asking is take what you do on your daily business, the more fun stuff that you're going to hear about afterwards. Way more fun stuff. Way more fun stuff. And think about this stuff in the background. There are tools to do this. Another, another boss of mine once told me a really good thing, which is no matter what you do, the first thing, if you want to talk to management, any management, make a model. And um, when I was in school, one of the, I, I'm a product of the, um, um, uh, I am also a product of the American public education system. And one of the common tropes there was show your work. Right? Do math homework, yeah, you come up with a solution, but you don't get points unless you show what you did. The model is show your work. A model is what? It is a set of mechanics right? that you feed with a bunch of inputs in order to arrive at a number or a thing. It spits something out. When you build a model, that can be, you know, for example, we have a CIA triad. Right? We, we have policies. We have certain risk ratings based on certain factors. Let the risk management organization deal with that. And you feed into it the gaps that you guys identify, that the risk managers identify, saying, oh, we don't have a so-and-so. We don't have a so-and-so. You know, we've got unpatched, uh, deck 3100s lying around, you know, running, running our, our, our trading platform. Don't laugh. I've seen stuff like that. Seriously. Um, you don't want to know what's sitting in the cellar of some of the world's largest organizations. Well, you do know. What am I talking about? This is, this is the wrong audience. You know exactly what's lying around down there in places. Um, but um, this feeds out to your management, to your leadership, to the board, that final number, ultimately. It feeds out this number that says, this is our level of risk. And there's a delta between the level of risk that you have deemed acceptable and the level of risk that this method that you have agreed to has identified, has quantified. Now, we used to joke in one, one job that we need to quantify level of security. So we came up with this concept of Securitrons. So rather than just mapping it to budget, you know, because people are sensitive, oh, it's the tech guys, it's the security guys, they want more budget, they want money again, they're always asking for money. Fuck off. And we say, well, we need to, we need to deploy more 27.5 more Securitrons to make the organization secure. Right? We don't have enough Securitrons, need more Securitrons. Whatever that measure is in your organization, it is ultimately the choice of your management. What you've done now, this is really cool. And this is the cool part. Trust me, this is really cool. You have done Pontius Pilatus. It's not my problem anymore. I told you what I think the issue is, and I've shown my work. Here's my model. Once you have a model, and this can be a thought model, it can be an Excel sheet, because those are fun too, right? Um, like I said, let the risk management organization deal with that. Once you have that model, though, somebody can question the mechanics. They can question the inputs, 
right? They can come to you and say, is it really true that we don't have so-and-so? They can question the validity of the inputs. Like, we don't have a so-and-so. And that's where you go back to the policies and you say, well, sorry, you know, you guys signed off on this policy and the board said we have to, so it's not my choice. I'm just following the rules. But they cannot question the existence of the model itself. What you have essentially done is you've now cleverly offloaded and outsourced the work of having to justify your budget. So you see how this all comes together. Now, this sounds kind of obvious, but a lot of organizations don't get this because they don't have that model. They've never put in that work. They look at it as a very, very tactical exercise. You know, we'll follow NIST, Cyber Risk Institute's, you know, checklists or whatever, some compliance framework. And by the way, I can't believe that these guys mentioned supply chain before. This is this, this, is this year's um, management buzz phrase, right? Like in the past, it was blockchain and whatnot, but... Uh, Expect to see a lot more of that, especially in European Union countries with uh, DORA and NIS2 regulations filtering down. We're already seeing it. And again, this kind of thing, these kinds of things give you the tool to do the work that you know need doing, needs doing, the coffee's wearing off, and to obtain the budget required for it. Because again, as a wise man once said, things cost money. And when somebody questions that things cost money, you say again, Remember my point about the Monetary Authority of Singapore? Pfft, you signed off on the model. If you want to change the model, go, go through that sign-off process. Go, go do that. Getting that kind of thing in place is often a bureaucratic, boring, long, frustrating process. But once you have it, talk amongst yourselves. Talk to the regulator, right? I'm just doing my job here. I'm doing, I'm doing you know, what I know is right. I'm advising you to invest enough money in this organization to let me do my job to protect you. If you don't want me to protect you, talk to the board. They signed off on the policies. Sometimes that doesn't work. You know? I, I mean, there are situations or company cultures where just you can't talk to anybody. You know, I, I have a, a good friend of mine in the UK. He works for a large financial trading company. He's trying to get them to put a risk management process in place. They don't have one. Think about that. This is a multi-billion pound organization. They will not spend 5,000 pounds on pen testing. Let that sink in. What does a good pen tester cost? We had this conversation last night. Remember, pay peanuts, get monkeys, right? They will not spend five grand on even a one-off pen test. In the words of a former chief risk officer, I'm not going to name the organization, when something was brought to me about a serious data leak of one of our uh, legal suppliers, it's outside our perimeter, so I don't care. Likewise, another good one was, uh, th these are all quotes, by the way, to my, to my, uh, to my, um, pen no, the, my, my security consulting team at the time. Stop probing our perimeter, um, um, environments because there was like half the stuff in there was undocumented. Because you might break something. <laughs> yeah. And when you can do things like that, not because you know it's a good idea. These guys were going off on their own doing this. And I was like, yeah, this is a great idea. We should do this. Not knowing what I know now, which is how to speak to the, C the, the CISO, the CIO, etc., to avoid these guys getting shit on for doing the right thing, but basically saying, okay, well, does your risk assessment process not take into account the fact that, you know, we have undocumented uh, perimeter applications with tie-ins to core banking systems, core financial processing and transactions, clearing systems um, that are unpatched, that are not managed by vulnerability management, incident response processes, but you have documented this, right, as part of your overall risk management process. The model. Right, The inputs are, this, this stuff isn't documented and our policies say it should be. The model is, well, based on that, it spits out a risk of so and so many. And the solution to that is to, is to deploy so and so many more Securitrons, i.e. give me my budget. And that's where we are. There's tons of tools for doing this. There's FAIR, there's the ORX taxonomy, there is, there, you know, there's a ton of, you know, questionnaires in the US, the FFIEC uh, assessment tool. There's, again, um, um, NIST, there is national central bank issued and other regulatory issued frameworks that you can follow. And, and I don't know how many risk management guidelines and the mechanics are beyond the scope of this. 
But what I'd like you to take away from all of this is please, 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 please talk to your risk management organization. Those of you who are in charge of teams who have the unfortunate um, hey, luck uh, to be involved in your budgeting processes, especially in large firms, please take this into account that you will not be as successful obtaining the tools for your folks to do what they need to be doing if you talk good practice. You will be more successful if you can contextualize this, this requirement, as a quantifiable measure of have we done what we say we're going to do, i.e. policies, and thus, have we done what we are required to do by the regulator? Right? Those of you who work in medical or financial or certain other fields will know this very well. And please, 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 just think of it in these terms. You will not have success in most cases, again, or you won't be as successful in terms of shoveling yourself free to be able to do what you need to be doing, to have that freedom to do, to apply your expertise, to protect the organization, and to do your jobs effectively. And again, to go home at five o'clock because you have sufficient resources. Because, you know, everybody in here has sufficient budget for what they need to do, right? Infosec, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. And by the way, another one of my things that always gets a laugh is when you ask the lawyers, can I do something, what do they say? Yeah. Another one I like to ask is, 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 does everybody in here has an application and data asset inventory, right? Yeah? Yeah? Exactly, yeah. Um, but these are all things that you can drive by, by policies, by risk management, by measuring the effectiveness of how your controls have been implemented. And thus... Rather than you guys having to deal with this crap, the subject matter experts, again, Pontius Pilatus, wash your hands, offload it, your ass is covered, you have a paper trail, go back to do what you need to do. That's it. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for letting me again um, open your minds to the fascinating world of risk management talking to your C-level. Um, those of you who are in financial services, we have a member meeting in Zurich hosted by Swiss Re at their marvelous facilities on the Mutant K on June 30th. Uh, registration is closed, but you know, if you contact me, my email address is on here. You're welcome to join us. We've got some really cool speakers. Um, those of you who are not, um, Please, and most, most financial services firms in Switzerland are, are members of our organization. Uh, those of you who are not, I, I hope to run into you at another conference. Um, let's see if some of the big ones are going to take place this year. Thank you very, very much for your time. I hope this has been not too boring, and I hope it's actually provided a little bit of uh, heightened expectations for the much sexier talks that we're going to be seeing for the rest of the days here. Thanks to our organizers. Well done, and uh, good luck. Enjoy. Enjoy.